Hey, this is Les Adams, and you're listening to the Bladeology Podcast. jump into it like we do every week welcome to another episode of the bladeology podcast we are on this week for our 39th episode it will be myself this is the vocal representation of jeremiah burbank from pvk vegas and elijah isham from isham blade works awesome and we are on with a guest this week we have craig Cameron of camera knives welcome thank you so much for taking time Hey, welcome! Thanks for having me on the podcast. Killer, man. Um, I've I, we've we've met before in person. Uh, I know of your forging work. I know of your ballet song work. I'm excited to get into this. Uh, so let's do it, man. T- uh, tell us how did you, how did you get into knife making? Where where did it all begin? Oh, it it started for me as a kid. I mean, I used to watch all the old Tarzan shows, and and uh, basically, I carried a knife for as long as I can remember. My uh, mom says that we never used to have a butter knife in the house when I was a kid because I used to steal them and take them outside and play. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I, I got started early on and, and uh, started collecting a little bit. Uh, I had a friend down in uh, uh, Louisiana that his dad run a gun shop and he run the knife part of it. And so he always, you know, let me trade and, and uh, we did a lot of trading back and forth and buying a wholesale. And, and, uh, so I had a pretty good collection and got to buying and selling a few knives and, and, uh, from there, you know, it just kind of morphed into the, went to a custom knife show and, and, uh, ended up buying a knife from, uh, old, um, now deceased maker, Jed Darby. And, uh, Jed was always pushing me to start making knives and, and, uh, I got to making knives and, he would always call and, and uh, check on me, see what I was working on and if I needed any help or anything. And that's kind of how I evolved into the custom knives. Uh, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of pushing from Jed Darby. Okay. Now you must, uh, you, did you start with forging or did you start with just stock removal? No, I actually started out forging and, uh, you know, I'd forged, uh, even as a kid, you know, we lived out on a farm and so, you know, we'd forge or, you know, we'd take the torch and take some big uh, nails and make throwing stars and play around with them and forge different knives out. But uh, I jumped kind of right into the forging and uh, I just, I really like to forge. I do some stock removal too. You know, I've got nothing. I don't know that one's necessarily better than the other with the steels. I just like to pound the metal. Uh, and take a lot of frustrations out on a piece of steel if you need to. <laughs> there you go. Okay, that works, man. Yeah. All right. Um, so you just, you jumped right into forging T- tell us a little bit about that. I'm, I'm always a little curious to see, like, I can see going to sort of Harbor freight and grabbing a grinder, but I mean, how do you, how do you do that? So you just, you built like a, a forge or you're saying you're always forging as a kid with a torch. So how, like, how did that work? Yeah, basically as a kid, you know, we would just, my grandfather showed us how to run a torch at a, probably an insanely young age, but, uh, uh, you know, we just fire the torch up, the acetylene torch, and and you know, heat the metal up to cherry red. And I'm sure we was probably doing a lot more harm than good with the steel <laughs> at that point. But, but uh, you know, we beat on it. And then uh, when I started getting serious in the knife making, uh, my father had uh, he was he always had horses, and and uh, he was a horse shearer also. Uh, so he traded with another horse shearer for a small forge, and uh, you know, I still got that forge table in my shop today and i've rebuilt the forge and changed the forge around quite a bit but uh the uh, basic rig is still there and uh you know once i got that i i just progressed on with it and and uh, started forging and you know adapted the forge more to to what my needs was as opposed to making horseshoes okay so now that uh, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to you're gonna have to yell at me on this one so that type of forge is that uh that's a coal-fired forge or is that a gas-fired forge at the time uh, it was a gas fired forge at the time and, uh, it was, it was just a, a small burner in there. And then it, uh, just had a few fire bricks around the outside, you know, with angle irons on the corner, just to hold the fire bricks up, uh, basically for the horseshoes, what this guy was doing, you know, he'd just shaped the horseshoes. So he, you know, he wasn't, didn't need a, you know, hot enough to weld or anything. Cause he wasn't doing, doing that type of work. But, uh, and then over the years, I, I, 
kind of scrapped that part of it and I got a, uh, a Don Fogg uh, designed forge. Uh, he had some, used to have some plans on the internet on how I built his forge and I just kind of modeled mine after, after the Don Fogg's forge and, and I've used that for probably, oh, 19, 19 years now. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's, that's well built then. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's had to be relined a few times over the years, but, uh, but the, you know, the basic burner, everything's the same burner. So, yeah. Hmm. So you, you also made a very clear distinction between, um, forging and then welding. So I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and assume that there's a huge amount of, of temperature and, and clean differences between, between the two. Yeah. When you're forging, you know, you, some steels, uh, you know, you don't get near as hot as you do maybe when you're forge welding. Uh, you know, it just causes grain growth on them. So you'll work them steels and forge them down at a lower temperature. Uh, you know, some will even crumble at a high heat. But uh, when you're forge welding, you know, you're getting up in the 22, 2300 degree temperature range. Uh, and basically what you're doing at that point is the molecules get to moving so fast between the two steels, they actually just start, you know, vibrating together. Uh, and then you do a little little press on there with, on the forging press and it just goes ahead and makes them molecules all into one solid bar oh wow all right okay and now how did you did you see you must have seen damascus at a custom knife show and you were like man that's awesome i want to do that or was it sort of just like a natural progression you were like how do i how do i make these two one homogenous piece of steel yeah it uh i mean it started out you know just forging you know probably like a lot of forgers, you know, I started out with an old spring. I got at a scrap yard and, uh, got to forging around, playing around with that. But, uh, as you get to forging, you know, you, you start looking for new challenges. You start adding the clay hummones. You start wanting to do some forge welding. And, and, uh, you know, I'm sure I seen it first place. I probably seen it was, was a uh, blade magazine or knives illustrated or one of the old, old, uh, uh, knife magazines. I used to get them pretty religiously, and I still do actually, but, uh, you know, that, that's kind of where I got to see in some of that, that work, uh, was the old magazines and stuff. Nice. Okay. All right. So, uh, a diligent reader of the, uh, of the industry trades then. Oh, for sure. For sure. Cool. All right. Um, so you, you got into forging, you fell in love, you had a little, a little help from another maker. Now along this path, was there any ABS involved or you were just, just going for it? Uh, yeah, I am a, a ABS. I got my journeyman stamp, I think in 2004. Uh, everybody else that did my class with me, my journeyman class or class with me has all become master Smith. They're always giving me a hard time about it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I'm a big believer in the ABS. It's a, it's a great group. Uh, you know, and like I say, I've been a, been a journeyman Smith for since 2004. So now what's the real, okay, so now you're, I, I've, I've heard this before, guys talk about this, but I mean, on, on practicality, what's the real difference between a journeyman and a master? Is it just the final test? I mean, you can, you've obviously got the skills. Well, I, I don't think you ever quit learning, I mean, between the two of them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I've done the performance test part of the Master Smith and passed it. Uh, and I was planning on, on submitting five knives at blade show this year, but you know, of course all that got canceled out. So next year I'll probably try to present my five knives, uh, and see if I can get, get the master Smith rating. But, uh, but there, there's, there's a, a big learning curve between apprentice journeyman Smith and master Smith. Uh, and I don't, I think once you get that master Smith, I don't think it's, you're ever going to stop learning. Uh, every time I go to a show or I talk to another maker, uh, or even read an article, you know, I'm learning something new, something different, uh, even if it's just the same procedure, but a different way to do it, uh, to save time or make something better. Uh, so I, I think the, the learning part of it's never going to stop for me. How long did it take to, uh, to get to your, your journeyman? Uh, to, to get to the journeyman, you have to be an apprentice for uh, two years. Uh, and then you can take, Two, two or three years. I don't remember. It's two or three years. Uh, and I think if you go down to, and take the ABS school, you can knock a year off of that. Uh, but uh, I wasn't able to do that. So I, I just waited out the full time frame. And uh, then you have to uh, build a knife that will bend. Uh, well, it starts out, you got to build a knife that'll, that'll cut through a two by four twice, uh, shave hair off your arm, 
and then cut a free hanging one inch rope. And then you have to flex that knife a full 90 degrees without it breaking or crack or can, it can crack, but I think it's only like a third of the way. Uh, luckily mine didn't crack. Uh, and then it's the same test for the master Smith. Only everything has to be done with Damascus steel. Uh, and then, then you present, I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit on your journey Smith. Then you prevent five knives to be judged, uh, to meet the quality standards. And, uh, you can't use any Damascus on the journeyman Smith knives. Um, and then, so then when you move to the master Smith, it's the same test Only your, you have to have a three, uh, 300 layer Damascus billet, uh, 10 inch long and, you know, the knife's 10 inches long. You got to bend it 90 degrees after doing the same performance test as before. And then you got to present the five knives to be judged again. And, and it's, it has a, it's to obviously a, be your own pattern, Damascus. Right. Yeah, the, the the bend test can be any 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 Damascus pattern uh, you you want to make. Uh, when you go into your performance judging, uh, you know they want to see nice nice stuff. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty stringent uh, uh, judging for the uh, fit and finish and, and quality. Uh, if there's anything off, you won't you won't make make it. You'll fail. To get the master in one of those knives, have to be a, a Quillian dagger. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah. Quillian dagger. Yep. Yep. And everything has to match. Uh, it's got to have a fluted handle with wire inlay. Uh, the wire inlay has to be half the depth uh, of the wire consistently on each wire. Uh, and uh, you can't glue the wire into the flute. You have to fit it in there so that it stays in there with pressure from the ends. Uh, so it's an in-depth process. <laughs> I would definitely go for it. I mean, you're already build, building valleys. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like I said, I, I had planned on doing it this year, trying it this year at Blade, uh, but when it got canceled and everything, uh, er, pretty early on, the ABS said that they wasn't going to test it that once they moved the date. So, hmm. And remind us, what were the other, there's the Quillian Dagon, and then what were the other four for the Master Smith? The other four can be whatever you like to make. Okay. Uh, and anything you turn in, so say I, I made a knife and a sheath. If I turn that sheath in, it gets judged too. Uh, so you really just want to present the knives uh, because I don't know, for me, I'm a, I, I feel I'm a better knife maker than a sheath maker. Uh, I've, on a real fancy knife, you know, I I'll may hire somebody to make the sheath, you know, Paul Long or somebody like that to make a real fancy sheath for them. So, I mean, it could be a, a straight knife or it could be a, a folding knife as well. Yes, it could be if you want if you wanted to turn in a folding knife. Oh wow! Yep. All right. Yep. That's pretty neat. Well, that's that's too bad that the blade got canceled for many reasons, and that's that's another reason we're going to add to the list, which is the which is the ABS tests. That's on. Yeah, that's for sure, for sure. So, but uh, but I'm I'm planning on it next year, uh, and uh, we'll give it a go then. Awesome. All right. So we're 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 in the forging. So we're forging. Uh, we're talking about. Uh, welding, and then tell us a little bit about the evolution from from that point, from forging into um, what was the next step for you? Uh, you know, after I started making the uh, Damascus, uh, you know, you know, you normally most people start out with just a, a random uh, pattern. Uh, you just forge weld it, and you're thrilled it stuck. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, you'll make some I random patterns. <laughs> yeah, I was too. Trust me. <laughs> I still am a lot of days. It sticks out here. I'm amazed. But, uh, but, uh, you know, from there, then you start doing uh, specific pattern manipulations where you're trying to get a specific pattern. Uh, and then you start developing your old pattern. Uh, I've got a couple, uh, uh, Loki's ladder, uh, I call it, uh, basically it's a modified W pattern uh with the uh, ladder only going about three quarters of the way up instead of all the way up uh i've got an evil eye damascus that i make uh and then uh i just actually made some a mosaic uh after you know i started doing patterns like that and now i'm starting to get make some more more and more mosaic patterns and uh, i just did one uh, uh i didn't invent the pattern but it's it acorns the when you get it done it looks like a bunch of little acorns in the steel which was a pretty neat pretty neat pattern i've got a couple knives forged out of that that i i've got to uh heat treat and then grind nice okay so yeah mosaic seems to be like that's really when when you start we start nailing down those patterns guys i know guys like that because then you have then you have your signature that's your signature steel 
and that's one step closer to, to doing that that sort of sole authorship piece where you where you make everything including the pattern right right yep for sure yeah that's uh and that's uh, on all my custom knives like that you know i do you know if, if they're marked with a js it is a, a sole authorship piece uh you know i've done it all made the steel if it's damascus and and all that stuff so but uh, you know, I also do some mid techs, and uh, you know, I, I do some uh, uh, stainless pieces, also some tactical pieces and stuff. But uh, if it's forged and marked JS, it's a sole sole authorship piece for me. Have you fooled around with with uh, making any time askers or any kind? Of uh, I haven't time haven't made any. I, I've used a lot of it, uh, but yeah, I haven't haven't made any. Uh, from what I understand about it, you have to have the, uh, uh, it's best to kind of maybe have an argon atmosphere in your, in your forge or kiln. And I don't have that, that set up yet. Oh, yeah. I don't know yeah. anything about it. I mean, maybe Nick can tell us about it, but, uh, yeah, for, from what I understand, you have to have to keep the oxygen completely from it. Uh, and a lot of guys are purging the, uh, oxygen out of their, their kilns, uh, with an argon purge. And, uh, so that keeps uh, the Tamascus clean you know, before the initial welds. That's the way I understand it anyway. Like I said, I haven't tried any of it, so. Right. Hmm. And um, so I, I was, uh, I was studying some of your, some of your sheath knives. And um, I mean, that there's a, there's a whole range of, of Damascus and of Hamones and the hilt work I find to be particularly exquisite. So you, you do some nice, some nice S curve hilts and um, I guess I'm not sure what the pattern is called, but it uh, it's like a grooved or a notch pattern on the on the end of the hilt. Um, yeah. So you, mm -hmm. you do all of that as well. Yeah, yeah. I'll do the uh, S guards, and uh, you know, I'll file them grooves in with files. I I do. Uh, uh, I've done a couple. Well, I've done quite a few clamshell guards where uh, I'll actually use a, a, a ball and a, a dapping block set. And I'll drive that uh, that clamshell up and actually raise it up above the surface of the steel, and then start filing in the clamshell on that raised portion, uh, and then blend it all in so it looks like a raised clamshell on the end of it. Okay, that's exactly yeah. Oh, that that yeah. I was gonna say I'm like it, it looks like a, like a scallop or maybe like a, like a like a deep sea bivalve, which is exactly yeah. like a clamshell yep. like that. Okay, yep. all right. So now have you always? Or, or rather, for your forging work, do you are all these knives that we're seeing are these orders, or are you just you're forging away and then then you just sell them uh, at shows or? Uh, the, it, it's a bit of both. Uh, the majority of stuff I make is usually on orders, uh, and uh, you know I I uh, actually went full time uh, uh, back in February, so I'm getting a little bit more time now where I can make some pieces I just want to make. Uh, and put them up for sale. But usually when I go to a show, I'll, I'll try to have, you know, five, six pieces that I can put on the table that I can sell at the show. Okay. All right. So the first introduction to your work that I had was um, a guy I work with at the shop. Uh, Cliff has a couple of your Bally songs with your steel and they're, they're gorgeous. They're extremely nice knives. So tell us a little bit about how, how did you get into making Bally songs? Because that seems <laughs> the, like a total divergence from forging. Like yeah, the yeah. Like I'm forging something. It's like, how are you going to make a Bally song? Yeah, yeah for sure. For <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was talking earlier about the, uh, the, the kid I used to trade with all the time uh, back in the 80s. And uh, basically, you know, in the 80s, the Bally songs were, were, were hot. You know, you had your Pacific Cutler, you your your, your, uh, uh, bench maids and stuff were coming out then. Uh, and so we traded a lot back and forth in NAM, uh, and I always played with them then. Uh, and I hadn't made any of them or, or, you know, messed with them too much. And, and, uh, another one of my buddies that, I, that he, you know, was a dealer for me, he's passed away now since, uh, but, uh, he had me make one for him. And basically, you know, he, he was on me and on me and on me and, and I hadn't made it and hadn't made it. And, uh, he said, Oh, come on, make me a Bali. So I said, all right, let me make you a Bali, you know, and to look at him, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, it's just, you know, two handles and a, and a knife blade. No problem. Well, when you get in there, there's actually pivot points. Uh, you know, you have to, your tang pins have to line up on both ends and then you got a, a latch on the end. And suddenly, you know, you went from two sticks and a blade to about six or eight precision points. Right. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. I realized uh -huh. it was a bit more difficult than I had anticipated, but, uh, 
I made that one for him and, and, uh, you know, it just kind of blossomed from there and I really enjoyed making them and, and, uh, just continue to make them. And, you know, I, I'll, you know, even on a lot of them, I'll forge it out and make the own, my own steel. Uh, others I've used some stainless Damascus, uh, that I've, that I've purchased, you know, it's just kind of what the customer's wanting on them. Hmm. That's very cool. No, I mean, to, especially to be, to be at that point in history where you're like, oh, I see this, the specific cutlery, right. And the bench maids. And then to just fo- to follow through with that years later is, I mean, that's heck, that's, that's the way to do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's an interesting, uh, uh, market, uh, because w- what I found is, you know, I, I'm selling a lot of custom knives to guys and gals, my age that played with them when they was kids. And then also the younger generation has, has adopted them and, and, have done you know they're they're buying them also uh so it's really an interesting group of people that that buy them uh, as opposed to to maybe some of the other groups uh the age range is just across the board for me i do i see that i i definitely yeah it's definitely from the super high-end collectors who want uh like bespoke soul authorship alley and then right then you have then you have the younger set who are also interested um so much so that you you got into making um a little bit of mid tech ballet songs or yeah i I don't know what the proper term is but that's the term that everyone sort of yeah yeah no i think that's that's the right term on them that uh the continuum series started for me uh and i've had uh three iterations of it and uh but uh basically on my mid techs uh I, you know, cut the, cut the links, the handle links. Uh, they're a square piece of titanium at that point. I, uh, a buddy of mine, he's got, a, he runs a CNC machine shop. So he, he milled out the slots for me and uh, drilled the, drilled the holes. Uh, and then when they come back to me, it's a full, uh, uh, you know, still square. I start, uh, doing all the handle work on it and curve everything over, you know, blend the handles in, make the profiles on the handles. Uh, the blade blanks, I had water jet cut out and, uh, then I, you know, hand profiled them, got them to thickness, uh, and then sent them out to, uh, Mike Erie and Mike Erie actually did the grind for me on, on the continuums. Uh, and then they come back to me, you know, I finished out the flats, put my name on them, put mid tech on them, uh, press the pins and then, then hand fit each one of them. Yeah. I've, I mean, I've handled them. They're, they're great. And everybody who, who I, so I have one. They love them. I mean, the the channel handle titanium, they're well balanced. They look great, and they just they they flip really nicely. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. They they've went went pretty good. Uh, the uh, the the original continuums was running on bearings, and then the uh, the one and the two series uh, have been running on bushings. And uh, so it's it's been it's been fun. Uh, definitely you know, two different styles of build. Once you get into the bearings and the bushings, uh, you know, when any, you get to uh, like any advantage to one over the other, uh, for me, I like the, uh, the bearings, uh, from a making standpoint. And then also mm-hmm. they're just so smooth. Uh, a I've lot of a lot the Valley f- guys, like, it, yeah, it, sorry, it doesn't seem to like they have one bearings. I don't know. Yeah, a lot. That's what I was going to say. A lot of the uh, the the flippers, they like the bushing systems. You get a bit of, of movement in the handles. Uh, you know, on a bearing, you know, you've got almost no no play in the handles. Uh, with the bushings, you have to have just a little bit of play so that you know they they'll they'll operate, they'll move. Well, that little bit of play, you know, from what I've talked to the flippers, that little bit of play also gives you some momentum on some of your tricks and stuff that they do when they're flipping, and so they. A lot of them prefer the uh, the bushings if they're if they're a hardcore flipper. Mm. Yeah, everybody wants bushings uh, right up until you take that same exact person and sit them down at a work table and say, "Okay, <laughs> now you fit the bushing yep. by hand and you grind each bushing, you know, one swipe of a sandpaper at a time. <laughs> assemble the knife, flip it, take it apart, grind the bushing, assemble it. Like I've done over it over and it's, over again. It's yeah, yeah, it's, yeah." Well, and that, that's, you would think that you could just say, okay, this, this is pretty simple. It's the blade thickness plus the thickness of your washers plus maybe a thousandth, but it just never seems to work out that way. I mean, from one side of the handle to the other side of the handle, 
you you'll have different thicknesses of of, of uh, washers or bushings, and it's just they to get them to work back, right. Basically. Yeah, yeah. It. Uh, I had. I was talking with a guy that he's coming out with his, his own line of uh, uh, butterfly knives, and that's. He's asked me, well, how do you figure your bushings? And I said, well, I said, unfortunately, I haven't figured out that magic formula. Just yeah. make all my washers this, this thickness, and it's going to work. And he was like, well, uh, okay. Uh, that's not a very satisfying answer. I said, I wish I could give you a more satisfying answer because I, it gets tedious when you spend two or three hours on one knife trying to fit that one bearing <laughs> or bushing, but, but you know, it is what it is. So. No, it's, it's really butterfly or ballet songs get down to that. You know, you're talking about like a, a 10th of a 10th of a, like a, of a hair yeah. and then you tighten it down and then you shake the knife and you can hear the blade shake around and you're like mother of and then you just take it apart like it's it's, yeah or you know on my on my my bearings you know i that is literally what it is it's like okay i did put my my bearing is this thick i want half my bearing into my blade so i take you know whatever that thickness is mill that into my blade pop them together i'm ready to roll that's it but bushings that don't work that way for some reason yeah the, and the bearing ones you can just crank the pivot down to like yeah. as hard as you want and then you're like okay great like that's it right yep. like the fitment is done yeah it rolls and and uh smooth you know yeah it's just it's crazy yeah. <laughs> um okay so that that brings up a, a couple of things so as far as equipment goes you said you mm-hmm. had a forge um but you're for the most part not running or you don't run CNC in your shop. You just, you're still pretty much what we consider hand handmade. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty much old school. Uh, I've got a, a forge. I've got a, a hydraulic press that I built probably pushing around 25 tons. Uh, I've got a, a KMG grinder. I've got uh, uh, a Paragon kiln. When I won forge and fire, they set me up with a new kiln. Nice. Thank you, Paragon. Fancy, fancy <laughs> Get guy. a little plug in there. there you uh, go. All right. And, <laughs> and then I got a, uh, a tabletop mill and, you know, you know, files and hand tools. And uh, I've got an anodizer and, uh, you know, a, uh, lots of arbor presses and things like that. But uh, that's no CNC in my shop. Uh, got nothing against it. I'd like to have one. But, uh, but yeah, uh, I probably wouldn't know how to run it if I got one, unfortunately. There you go. <laughs> great. So great, great transition point. Tell us about your forge and fire experience. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, yeah, they, uh, they contacted me, uh, to be on a show, uh, for season one and I had mixed feelings about it. I didn't know what they was going to do. I had seen some reality shows where, you know, they had, it was just terrible misrepresentations of what people actually did. And so I kind of declined. Uh, then I watched, uh, the first season and, uh, you know, they called me back for the second season. Wanted to know if I wanted to do it. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll do it. And, uh, so I went on with basically no preconceived notion. I was just went there to have a good time. Uh, met some interesting people, uh, still friends with all the, all the people that was on my episode. And, uh, it, it, it was fun. It, it was really, really good time. The bon- bona fide TV star, huh? <laughs> Infamous more than famous, probably, but yeah. Okay, all right, all right. So, I mean, so the whole the whole forge and fire process. I mean, you did you? So, what is that? You go up to the studio. You have to stay there. Like, there's a shooting schedule, and you're just forging all the time. It's yeah, like... ba- you know, it, it's like everything else. Uh, basically, uh, you know, they they called and did a phone interview first. Uh, then you did a Skype interview, uh, and then uh, once they decided, okay, we're going to go with you, then you get a, a full background investigation on you. Uh, they do a, have detectives and check you all out and make sure you, who you say you are and, and uh, everything like that. Uh, once you get past that, then uh, they set up dates, and they flew us out to uh, – uh, when we filmed it, they was doing it in the Bronx at uh, one of the two fire uh, proof stages in New York. And uh, so we was, we was there in the Bronx. Uh, me and uh, Harry, the guy that was on one of my episodes, were sitting outside and of the hotel, and the fire trucks come up. Okay, they left. Pretty soon, an ambulance come up, and uh, they left. And I said, Harry, all we got left is the police, and pretty soon, yeah. come the police. So <laughs> well, all, the, all the emergency services showed up at the hotel the first night, uh, which was kind of hilarious. But uh, 
uh, you know, it was a nice, it was a nice, you know, decent hotel. I mean, it wasn't nothing in a bad neighborhood or anything. It was just funny. It just so happened. They all showed up. But, uh, then the next day we went down to the, uh, uh, the, uh, film room and, uh, basically they started us in and, and, uh, you know, it's neat to see how TV show is made. Uh, when that clock starts, that is truly all the time you have. That clock don't doesn't stop. We had three hours, and once once that three hours is up, you was done. It didn't stop for anything. Uh, but you know, walking up to that anvil before it all started, and some of the banner and stuff, you know, you may walk into that room 15, 20 times, and they're taking you know pictures from all different angles and everything, uh, and film. But uh, the uh i don't know how the cameramen do it they had like two or three cameramen assigned to each person uh then they had safety people assigned to each person and uh how they get them shots without getting everybody else in the frame is just amazing uh one of the cameramen at one point he crawled up underneath my grinder and he's looking up at the bottom of the belt and i said dude you're gonna get shower sparks i don't care just do it just do it he said (laughs) All right. And so I did. And I mean, it just sparked him. He wasn't under there very long, but uh, he got a, got some pretty cool shots. And, and you'll they'll they'll play that uh, that footage still to this day on on different promotions and stuff where it's just the sparks raining down on that camera. But, it's all about the footage. Nobody cares about the camera operator. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was exactly right. <laughs> so now what what season was that? When 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 can we? Uh... I was season that. season two episode season one. Season two, okay, wow. Yeah, so you, you the Warhammer. Were, you were you were in there right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay, the Warhammer yeah. was that your was that the final forge? Yes. Yeah. We uh, uh, me and Jeff Bridges was that was at the last two there. It's uh, not really a spoiler alert. It's been out long that long, but uh, uh, we was the last two in there, and uh, so we were standing there. They had the uh, cloth over, you know, and you can't see and. You know, they, they'll stand you there for 10, 15 minutes and without saying anything, just looking at you, trying to make everybody nervous. And uh, the, uh, I said, Jeff, I said, that's a war hammer. And he said, no, no, it's not. I said, yeah, that's a war hammer. And I said, that's cool because I already have a design made for that. Uh, I'd worked with a customer at one point. He wanted a big war hammer. And uh, so I had it all designed up. We'd research it historically. Uh, and so basically when it, when they pulled that cover off and it was Warhammer, I was like, yes, uh, I just went home. I didn't have to look up drawings or anything or historical notes. I just pulled out my work. We'd already done on one, uh, and what started making and going to town. Hmm. I mean, that's, that's, awesome. that's pretty badass. I know Warhammer seems like the ultimate, uh, I mean, that's like a, hmm. yeah, I'd I mean, go for a Warhammer. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's like battle the, the, song, your battle song maker and you win forge and fire with a warhammer i mean that's pretty yeah cool. yeah and the, and when you look at the warhammer you know people are kind of like oh it's just a, a brutish weapon actually the the warhammers at the time the warhammers come out they was into plate armor heavily and all the joints on a on a suit of armor were articulated and so what you'd find is they would they would target the articulations and they would you know you get hit in the in the shoulder and it locks up that that articulation in your arm you're basically a dude standing there in a can and then they'd turn around and pick them and uh, there was one of the uh, uh, major battles. I'm trying to remember which one it was. It's not coming to me off the top of my head. But over 75% of the uh, the the skulls that they found in the graves had been picked. They would they would knock that articulation and just lock them up, and then they'd just pick them with the back of that hammer. That is but that is rough. Pretty brutal. Yeah, yeah, it's brutal. There's no doubt about it. That was a that was a whole be, different uh, type of warfare. For I'm sure, I'm for be. sure. A um, tomahawk with a uh, big, huge pick on it. Mm-hmm. It's all. It's like you know, three D four. It's uh by a guy named uh, Beaver Bill. Yeah. It's yeah. 3D. Yep. Yeah. Sure, you're familiar. Yep. 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 It's kind for of, sure. It's kind of on the fringe. Like not a lot of people know about him. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I've I've done a lot of the tomahawks with uh, the spikes. I had one guy in the army. Uh, he wanted to go through a Kevlar helmet, and I said, "Dude, I said I I don't have a Kevlar helmet to test this on." And so I sent it to him and, and he, he, you know, a couple months later, he, he texts me, he says, dude, he said, it works perfectly. My, my sergeant is so pissed at me. He said, he set his helmet down. I just picked the hole right in it. Oh, <laughs> I said, yeah, I bet he is kind of mad. <laughs> you didn't need that. That's, that's fine. That's fine. That's all part of the testing process. It's mm-hmm. all right. They'll issue For you sure. another one. probably. <laughs> 
But, you know, it, it's pretty neat, you know, when you hear some of the, the different things that, that's happened to your knives. I've, I've had, you know, uh, Slim, uh, Slim Pickens is kind of one of my main uh, lines that I do. And I've had them, you know, all over the world in the uh, hands of different military and, and police. And, and, you know, it's just amazing. You get some of the stories back from them, uh, you know, how they used your knife and everything like that. I mean, I, I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty awesome. Like when, when you sell somebody a tool like that and they, they let you know they're using it for the intended or, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. un, unintended, but exactly. it works, you know, yep. that's, yep. That, there's, there's two forms of collectors, right? I mean, which are both awesome. The guys, you know, who, who collect them for the artistic purposes. And then certainly the guys who are like, no, this is a, this is a tool which I intend to use. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yep. Because, I mean, you, you build them to be, you know, to stand up to that. Oh, yeah. Even my Damascus pieces, uh, you know, I I build them to use and, and test them before they leave and make sure they're going to hold up and everything like that. Uh, in this season here in <laughs> Illinois, we're getting ready to go into deer season. And probably for the last two months, mostly what I've been making is, is uh, fancy Damascus hunting knives. Uh, the guys, you know, they like to take them to their, their deer camps and show off to all their buddies that they you know, check out my new knife and and uh but then in the end you know they're they're using them you know to process their game that's awesome there you go all right yeah the the, i mean that's right the damascus the forge and fire you know we we've talked about this before uh which is every time we go to a knife show and we're in an uber or something and the uber driver asks us and they're like you know what do you guys do and we're like oh you know we try to sort of politely figure out what to say, and then we end up just sort of laughing. Oh, we're, we're in the yeah, knife cool. industry. Mm-hmm. And then the first thing they go is they go, oh, do you guys do Forged in Fire? And we're always like, no. like that's." But I feel like that's the that's the one connection that the public has to like the, the knife industry is like, oh, yeah, Forged in Fire. Like, you, you guys must do that. And in yeah. this case, you actually Before did do it was that. Swords. You know, it was yeah. It, it, it's yeah. actually amazing how many people come up to me and, you know, after, you know, they'll see me or they'll see my episode, they'll come up to me, they'll email me, they'll call me and had no idea that there was a custom knife market. Uh, and it's just opened so many people's eyes to this, this market and brought so many people into this market. Uh, you know, there's some of the testing on there. It, it's, it's designed to make a knife fail and, and they do. Uh, and some people don't like that. But at the same time, it's a TV show and they have to have their entertainment value to keep their ratings and keep people buying commercials. Uh, so they have they they're shooting for that end of it, where as a maker, just the exposure, not only for myself, but for the whole industry uh, and all the customers that it's brought into the industry has been huge for me. And uh, most of the makers I talk to, uh, whether they agree or disagree with the show they'll all agree that it's just brought a tremendous about a customer base into the, into the market. Mm. Like at blade show every year, like a couple years, we've seen like an increase in a head count. It's, it's gotta be because of that show. Yeah. You know, we was actually, they had uh, every year they'll get us together and they'll, they'll take pictures out there. Uh, Doug Mark Carter and, and uh, uh, Jay Nielsen, all of them, David Baker. But uh, uh, I think it was last the last blade show they actually everybody was out there and all the fans was out there and it actually blocked off the the hallway and oh, wow. they come out and says you know you guys have to move you guys gotta uh, get the way. and and doug doug was up there and he says he says all right we're gonna move we're sorry for blocking the road he said but i have one question how many people how many of these people here how many of you people out here that are blocking the hallway are here because of fortune fire and um, but 95 percent of them raised their hand and he says how many of you are here for the very first time. And I would say at least half of them raised their hand that that was the first time they'd ever been to Blade Show and they did it because of Fortune Fire. Uh, so the amount of people that it's putting through the doors at events like that, you know, it it it, it helps us makers. Oh, wow. You know, I, that's an aspect I didn't even think of. And it's good to hear that that's like a, it's an agreed upon response from people who have been on the show because that's great to hear. I mean, it's, you can never have enough people interested in in knives i mean we're you know the more people you the think about that, that yeah yeah like... no. i mean even now my my show of my rerun will come on i every time my rerun comes on i get people calling emailing me uh and usually get some orders from it oh well, and that's, that's just a residual value of it has been great huh 
Plus, I made a ton of Warhammers after that too. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. I bet you're like, okay, I don't, I don't even want to make another Warhammer. Now. Like, <laughs> I did 19 it. of them after the show. So. <laughs> okay. Well, I bet those people are just lucky. That's, like, yeah, yeah, they're loving them. Man, I got my Warhammer. I actually had a guy went on a hog hunt with one of them, oh, <laughs> and wow. then sent me videos. <laughs> okay. It it worked. <laughs> yeah. Right. In in so many ways, like oh, it, it definitely worked. It's yeah. The, uh, the finishing blow of the hog, you know, like no, no worries. The hammer did its job. Yeah, yeah, it did, it did. But uh, it was crazy. Oh, that's 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 pretty awesome. That's that's good to hear that Forge and Fire really is sort of you know bring bringing bringing people into the community, and uh, and in adding 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 eyes to the scene. You know, that's that's for important. sure. That's that's yeah. Important. Any introductions good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, you know, it just brought in a whole a whole group that had no ideal, and that's that's what I always get. People are just amazed that they you know they didn't know this even went on, and uh, you know once they're getting into it, you know then their kids want to forge, and and uh, I do a, a hammer in here every year at my house, and and uh, that's usually how I fill the time instead of so I don't have to stand behind the forge and hammer for nine ten hours. There's usually a kid or two in the audience. And I say, hey, you want to make forge out a knife? And they say, oh yeah, yeah. You know, get their parents' permission. You know, they'll come up and I help them forge out a you know railroad spike knife or something like that. And and uh, you know, everybody seems to have a good time, and and uh, they keep it keeps growing every year. So that that's pretty cool. To, okay, yeah. Go, Elijah, know who's whose idea it was to start forge of fire did anybody ever mention that like was it one specific person was i it a think knife maker like, i uh, think jay nielsen and uh 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 oh shoot uh i've always jason thought knight him. has has been it was involved in it uh and mm-hmm. trying to get that off the off the ground i know jason was actually on a they, there's a lot what they call the lost episode uh jason knight was was uh on that and one uh, but they've never aired that one that I know of. Uh, but that was like the pilot. And I think him and Jay Nielsen was kind of involved in that from what I understand. Now there may have been more, more going on behind the scenes that I don't know about, but it's kind of what I understand. Yeah. Okay. So now you, you host Hammerins at your, at your house. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, basically, uh, Usually it's in the uh, spring, uh, in late uh, April, early May. Uh, I'll have a one day event, and uh, you know we bring a food truck out, and and uh, people come up from all over the area, and I've had people from quite a few different states come to it. Uh, but uh, we do that every year, and and uh, this year we was scheduled. Uh, uh, Kim Stahl, who was also on Fortune Fire with me, she she lives in St. Louis. She was going to come up and and uh, forge out some cable Damascus. Uh, Mike uh, or uh, Craig Schneider was going to come up, and uh, he was going to do a grinding demonstration. So I'm kind of incorporating some other makers coming in too, and give kind of their perspective on how they do things, just so you know it doesn't get stale with the people that keep coming over and over and over. Uh, they're getting introduced to new things from new people, and and uh, you know we keep trying to grow that event. That's that's really awesome. Okay, is there is there somewhere specific people can find out more about that? Yeah, I'll usually put it up on my website or or my social media as we're getting closer. Okay. Uh, and uh, the website I've got, uh, I haven't updated in a long time. I'm actually getting ready. I'm working on building a new website. Uh, it'll be the same address and everything, but uh, but uh, something a little more user friendly where I can update it easier and everything like that. Nice. Okay. So I mean, so you're still, I mean, you're an integral part of the forging family constantly. I mean, that's not something in the background. You are forging all the time and hosting hammer ins. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So now, how do you find the forging set versus sort of the tactical knife set? Because it seems like you you bridge the gap there. I mean, you you sort of make tactical knives, but you're also a forger. Um, yeah, and and uh, it, it's for me. I I. I love knives. Uh, it doesn't matter to me whether knife stock removal forged, uh, you know, how it's made CNC, whatever. If it's a nice knife, I, I like it. Uh, that's just me. I'm just into knives. Uh, and, uh, you know, you get some groups, you know, there's, if it's not forged, it's not a knife or if it's not stock removal, it's not a knife. There's, you know, a little clash between some groups, but for me, I, I'm, 
I just like knives. So, you know, I make whatever I feel, feel like making and, uh, you know, how I make it. And I'm always honest on, you know, how I make something. And, you know, if anybody asks me how I made that, I'll straight up tell them how I made it. And, and, uh, you know, I, I do try to bridge that gap because there's the tactical knife scene. I don't think that's ever going to go anywhere. Uh, I think that's entrenched. Uh, you know, we've had the buoys for 150, 200 years now. Uh, they're still going. And I think the tactical knife scene is going to be that, that way too. Yeah, buoys kind of stuck around, huh? Seems like those yeah. are going to be uh, popular. Yep, yep. <laughs> that's but, true uh, American design. Right. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Yep. yep. That's a true American art form. So now as far okay, so as far as uh as as uh straight knife patterns go, um so is that would would you say that that is your favorite pattern is the buoy? Uh for straight knives, yeah, I I would say the the buoy the buoy pattern and it, the the thing is there's so many different styles of them uh depending on you know whether you're doing full antique reproductions or you know kind of blending them styles. Uh I would say that's probably my personal favorite. Uh, I do a lot of the uh like I said that Slim Pickens model I do a lot of that. That's a, kind of a uh it it kind of bridges the gap uh between the tactical and the buoy, uh, it's kind of a, a slimmer buoy shape and they go anywhere from, you know, a four inch blade. I've done them all the way up to, to a 11 inch blade. Uh, and I've done them, you know, just a, uh, a blasted finish all the way to a full dress Damascus with ivory handles. Uh, and so that one kind of bridges the gap for me. And that's probably, probably one of my most popular models, uh, into straight knives that and the, uh, whitetail classic hunters, uh, that I do, uh, and you know i do that that style and shape it's kind of a drop point uh and uh you know with stag handles and and uh, you know that's probably my my most popular straight knife models nice okay so do you ever get tired of people asking you to just make lovelesses or is that do you, you just pass uh i've made a couple uh and i i just i no i i like them i really like them I just can't make a loveless. <laughs> okay. All right. You know, enough. you look at you look at you look at Loveless's grinds and stuff, and and I know that he had other people working in his shop in his later years and stuff like that. But you look at them deep deep hollow grinds of just a beautiful spine between the hollows and stuff. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just it's not what I make. Uh, I don't dislike them at all. I love them. I love to look at them, and I think they're a beautifully executed knife. Uh, it's just not what I make. I don't do it justice. Let me let me put it that way. That works, yeah. Jeremiah. That works. I thought you were going to ask him to build you a New York special or something. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask that one first. You know, I was like, going to get that out of the way. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Stag. I've said it before. I, lo- I oh, love yeah. Stag. I think Stag yep. is the ultimate. Like, if your hands are wet or dirty, it's naturally grippy material. Um, I think it looks great. I don't know. I'm just. Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. For it's, sure, and and uh, it it grips you, and, and uh, that and ivory, ivory does the same thing. People, you know, they pick up ivory and they think, oh, it's slick; it, it won't stay in your hands. Uh, I went on a hog hunt with Bowie knives. You know, it's been quite a few years back, but uh, when I got my hog, when I got done, I just turned over because it's giving me a hard time because I had ivory handles. I turned my hand over and opened it up, and I had a it was probably a, a nine inch buoy, and it was just stuck to my hand. The, uh, nice. you could open your hand, the, the blood reacts with the ivory and it just sticks in your hand. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it gets yeah, all it's crazy. Sticky. Yep. Yep. I did not know that. Okay. Yep. So actual tactical benefits to ivory. Yeah. And that's why a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the, uh, year old, uh, Texas Rangers and marshals and, and even outlaws and stuff, they had, had a lot of them had, uh, ivory grips on their guns and sure. it wasn't okay. just to be pretty. It, I mean, don't get me wrong. The beauty of it is, is just outstanding, but, uh, there's, there's, I think there's, there's some science tactical to reason too. to, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. They're both natural materials. So they yep. react. Yeah. Huh. Yep. Another thing, not a lot, a lot of people hear about. Yep. Yeah. We're educational on this point. The, the reaction <laughs> between blood and ivory. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. That's yeah. Important. If I'm talking about hunting a lot, it's, it's like I said, it's about two weeks till bow season starts here. So I'm pretty excited about it right now. <laughs> okay. So you're, so you're an avid hunter. You can't wait. To oh yeah. There. For sure. For sure. Okay. Is it, is it mostly whitetail in, in Illinois? Yeah. In Illinois, it's, it's whitetail. Uh, there's rabbits and squirrels and quails and stuff, but, uh, the big game here that everybody's after is the, uh, the, the, the white tail and you know you know towards the river the ducks and, and geese and all that but uh, yeah white tail for me nice okay yep. all right i like it 
Um, yeah, the the straight knife thing is really uh, right. Bowies aren't going anywhere, and uh, you know they're they're here to stay with with the size and the different styles. Um, Elijah designed a large fixed blade, and I wonder if you've ever made no. uh, what was it a keyhole? Oh yeah, it's it started out as a key. I was gonna like my plan was to like oh I'm gonna forge something someday and I'll make this, but then it turned into you know like just a stock removal thing for we to make. But uh yeah, it was a key, it was gonna be a keyhole integral. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. yeah, have you ever made a keyhole? I haven't made a, a keyhole. One? I've seen them made uh, and mm-hmm. understand the process, but no, I haven't made one of them. Uh, it's I mean it's, I it's a really cool knife. Like, yeah, very basically. Like, but yeah. that's about it. Just surface level. Yeah, that's that's I guess, me. I've I've seen it done till I actually sit down and do something. That's mm-hmm. when I start understanding it. You know, by doing I it guess, and and figuring it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's a it's really neat. I I think it's it's really yeah. neat concept. It's carved in these basically just kind of hammered in slowly or mm-hmm. something. Press it in. Yeah, yeah. So it's if like you got to press, good. you can just press it in. And, uh, you know, you're pushing with 25 tons of force there. You know, you get it close and then just, just press fit that thing in there. And it's, it's not going anywhere. Hmm. So the, it's the tang kind of stops, uh, like at the keyhole or there's, there is a tang that trails to the end of it. I've seen them done both ways. I've seen them where the, uh, you know, you got your integral part of the knife and then you get the keyhole and they'll press it right in there. Uh, and just stop there and maybe pin it from top to bottom. Maybe not. And then I've also seen some guys that will take and come in from the end and uh, thread that into that integral part so they can put like a, a nice butt cap or something on it too. Uh, you know, I've seen it, I've seen it done all three ways. Now, is it just, is it just a, is it a forger's trick or, or is it, is there a real tactical purpose to the design behind the keyhole? Uh, I don't know if if there's, you know, a, a practical practicality to it. Uh, you know, you're saving steel, of course, but uh, you know, in, in the the long run, you know, your steel isn't that expensive on knife unless you're getting into your mosaics, which a lot of the keyholes are mosaics. Uh, but it's just a different way. Uh, you know, I've also seen knives where they will uh, instead of uh, uh, you know doing a full uh, full tang they'll take and you know they'll make a outline of the full tang and then set the handle into that material and and uh, you know different ways just just different things you know just floats people's boats and just trying to be a little different i think different yeah. construction methods yeah yep for sure because that because that makes sense mm-hmm. do you have a preferred uh tang style that you do well, what's the one on the uh slim pickens uh slim pickens is a uh uh, uh stick tang and uh, basically what I, what I do with that is uh, uh, press fit the guard on, and then I will uh, mortise uh, the handles onto there. Uh, and I usually dovetail them mortises so that when it all goes together, uh, the epoxy flows into them dovetails on both sides of that, locks it in that way. And then that usually has a couple of bolts on it also, uh, and then a thong hole usually on that, that particular model. Uh, it's really designed as a hard juice model. And knock on wood, I haven't had a... Uh, uh, stick tang fail. So, oh, wow. You know, but, but okay. you know, when you come off of them, I, I just come down just a little bit from that tang on top and bottom, you know, and gradually taper it out to the back, but where that, that, uh, blade and that ricasso meet, I try to keep it as, as wide as possible. Uh, kind of my construction method on that. Uh, a lot of people do it different. A lot of people will file all the way around the, uh, the tang. Uh, I don't, I'll actually, when you look at my knives from that guard to that end of that ricasso, there's actually a slight taper in there. And so from the, the end of that ricasso all the way to the end of my tang, there's a slight taper. And so I'll take that, that uh, guard and get it to where, you know, it's maybe an eighth of an inch or 16th of an inch from fitting up against the back of that ricasso. And then I'll drive that on, uh, all onto that taper. So it, you know, it's, it's a press fit onto there. Uh, so you don't get any rattle, you don't get any movement, uh, you don't weaken your tang structure. So, so really, what you're saying is full tang is just some modern nonsense. Stick tang works just fine. Uh, it works just fine. I mean, you know, from a from an engineering standpoint, your your full tang is going to be stronger. Uh, but 
you know, the amount of press pressure you're going to have to put on, on a properly made stick tang to break it, you've, you've broken your knife already anyway. Hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, cause your blade's going to be hard and you've probably snapped that blade long before you do the tang. So oh, wow. because your, your right. tang shouldn't actually be as hard as your blade or mine, mine aren't anyway. Interesting. Okay. Can we talk a little bit? That's interesting. So there, so there's the right. So the blade is one and then the tang is another. Uh, yeah. When I, like when I, when I uh, harden my blades, I'll actually, uh, come down from about on the bottom of the castle, uh, about halfway to maybe the, end of the ricasso going towards the blade i'll angle that in there and i won't harden i don't harden my tank i keep that tang uh uh where it's more ductile uh i would rather you know it bend than break uh but i haven't had anybody bend them you know at, the, at that juncture either uh but uh but you know try try to build them for strength and you know like i say i use them all the time and and uh you know i do destructive tests out here just to make sure everything's still holding up and my heat treat's still right and uh trying to put out a serviceable product, you know, that actually, um, that makes a lot of sense because you, you wouldn't want the tang to, to snap if it was too hard. Wow. So tell us a little bit about your, uh, tell us a little bit about your, your show circuit. Um, okay. when did you, yeah. when did you start going to blade show? How, how long have you been going to blade show? Uh, I've been going to blade since 2002. Uh, in 2000, I really got, I'd played with making knives before that, but in 2000, I really got serious about it. Uh, and started, you know, trying to turn out good product and, and, you know, doing the show circuits, starting to go into the shows and everything, uh, became a, a member of the ABS, uh, that type of thing. And, uh, you know, I started out just doing a couple local shows. And, uh, then by 2002, I was doing blade and, uh, currently my show circuit starts in uh, January. Uh, I go to, to the local show at St. Louis show, Gateway Area Knives Club. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Love those, all those local shows. Yeah, it, it, and it, it's a good show. Excuse me, it's been going on for well since before I started making, uh, and uh, you know it, it's got a really good customer base to it, uh, and uh, so we go down there and do that one, and then they have a uh, uh, every second Thursday of a month they have a meeting down there. You can go down trade knives, show knives, that type of thing. Uh, so it's a, a good group up up in this area. And uh, then I'll do the Little Rock show. I hadn't done it in a couple years. Uh, and then I was going to get back into it this year. I had a table this year. Uh, and I, I'd done it for, I think, 13 years and then missed a couple years just because of scheduling conflicts and couldn't make it. And uh, then now my schedule's changed. So I was going to get back in this year. And I had a table at that one. And uh, that was the first show that got canceled for me. Uh, my next show is usually uh, the Blade show. Uh, and then the... I did a uh, show this year, first time in uh, Missouri, uh, in Washington, Missouri. It's it's a local show that's just starting out. I think this was the second year, and uh, good little show, especially when nobody been to a knife show in all year. So <laughs> they had it, and a lot of people came to it. Uh, and then uh, I do the uh, USN show, and that's usually the last show of the year. Uh, there's another little local show in Mount Vernon that I do sometimes. Oh wow! Okay, so you actually you actually stay pretty busy with with your show circuit. Yeah, yeah, I do a, do a five or six of them a year usually. Wow! All right, that's I mean that's awesome. That's that's you know we're huge proponents of shows, and as we people always hear us saying that knife shows are really you know that's I think that's where the awesomeness is. You know, come out and meet the makers, meet fellow collectors. You know, talk about knives, handle knives. That's that's where the magic is, you know. Oh well, that that's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, that's just it. You know, a guy comes to my table. I got two slim pickings. One of them may fit his hand better than the other, but you know, if he's buying it, you know, doesn't get to come out and see it. You know, he never knows the difference between it. You know, you can actually pick them up, feel them, see how they fit your hand, see how they move around. You know, the different grips and everything like that. And and like you say, you get to talk to the maker, meet the maker, and and. Uh, you know, shoot, I've, I've made so many friends over the years from, you know, doing the shows and hanging out and, you know, just that, that type of thing. It's, it's always a blast. I love doing the shows. Yeah. And I, you know, I think we'll see, I think the small shows are going to become even more popular, obviously just because of, of everything that's happening right now. I think that small shows are really, I think people will look for more small local shows to go to like, like club shows, we would call them. But yeah, I, I think the, uh, the smaller shows, they're, they're growing, uh, you know, people can go out thinking, like you said, this little St. Louis show we do. I mean, it's not a little show. It's a, it's a good show. But, uh, 
you know, we have that meeting every, every month and, you know, we'll go and hang out and trade knives and, you know, everybody's always trying to show the next guy up what they picked up between the months, you know, and, and uh, traded for. And so it, it's a, it's a good time, you know, it's just part of the knife community, I guess. Yeah, no, I think it's, I definitely think trade shows for us. That's, that's one of the best parts of the knife community. Cause it really, you can put a face with the name. You can put your hand on the knife, you know, shake hands, you know, strum the blade. Please don't do that, but it happens. For uh, sure. For sure. Know, <laughs> it's uh, it, it works. It works pretty well. Uh, I yeah. Think it. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, I don't, you know, know that that's ever going to go away just because people like to come out and they see the maker touch the blades, like you say, and, and uh, it's just it's a it's an experience, I guess, is, is is as much as anything, you know, they get to come and experience everything and, and uh, talk with everybody. Yeah. All right. I, I dig it. So um, so you've got the you've got the forge work with the straight knives. You've got the ballet songs. Now, the continuum is that uh, how's that working? So are you working on a batch now? Should we look for a batch? Uh, the continuum I've got. Uh, I think I've got uh, about. 12, maybe not even that many, 10 or 12 blades out there left. Uh, I think I'm going to set these up as dedicated flippers without a latch. Uh, and then I think the continuum line will be over for a while. I have some more uh, handles, but I don't have any blades made. Down the road, there may be another one. Uh, but I, I, would, uh, I think I want to go with a new design next time. And... Uh, so, you know, after these 10 or 12, I may not have a uh, mid-tech for a little while. I think the next one will be a, uh, the next mid-tech I do will be a sandwich style. Uh, and uh, they'll be coming out. Uh, but then, like I said, the, the last continuums, I'll have a group that's going to come out. It'll be as latchless design in the, uh, uh, where the latch goes at the end on both handles. I'll have a, uh, I think it's probably going to be a, p- a piece of G10 in, in, late, in set into them. And uh, I'll grind that all down when I'm when I'm shaping the handles and everything. And uh, if they're going to be dedicated flippers, it'll add a little bit more weight to the end of the knife. Nice. Okay. Yep. All right. I like it. Um, and then the 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 straight knives. So you're just are your books open? Um, can people just contact you, place orders? How does that work? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My books are open. Uh, I was backlogged uh, about two years. Uh, in like I said, I went full time in February. Uh, and I work, you know, I'm working through them, through them backlogs and, and, uh, right now I'm about three to four months out on a, on an order if the person's wanting to order. Uh, and, uh, so it's, it's been going, going pretty good, but, uh, I'm working, got a couple other irons in the fire. Uh, I'm working on a, uh, a double ball Denton type slip joint. Uh, oh. and then I'm also working on some, uh, automatics playing oh. around with them a little bit. So, oh boy. All right. Yep. Some autos, right. huh? Yeah. Okay. Springs. All right. Yeah. <laughs> anything that, you want to talk about there? Yeah, anything no? you want to anything you want to reveal or uh uh I they're in the works. The uh the uh double ball dent and slip joints, they're they're probably closer uh to to being ready to go to market than uh, the autos are. I'm still playing kind of playing around with a couple different designs on the uh the autos, whether it's you know the the uh push button where the spring and everything's all on the button uh, latches in the button versus the more traditional original, you know, style with the spring in the, inside the, the handle. Uh, I'm kicking both back and forth and playing with both of them and haven't really decided which way I'm going to go. Ultimately it's probably going to be both ways. Uh, <laughs> Cause I like them both right. as I'm playing with them. They both have their strengths and weaknesses. So that's true. Uh, yeah. Leaf spring versus yeah. coil spring. Yep. 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 For sure. Okay, well that's that's exciting. That's definitely something I would definitely be interested in. So that's that's cool. Uh, and then the the slip joint. That's that's very cool. So you're saying it's a it's a double ball. Yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, it the uh, the liners. I have a uh, like a liner lock. Uh, you know, just normal liner lock. Uh, instead of being on the edge, I have to actually have that in the center of the handle, and. There's a, I've got one on each side and there's a ball, uh, ball denton in them. And, uh, they, there's a ball denton drilled into the blade closed open and halfway. And, you know, that actually causes your pressure for the slip joint instead of pinning it in and there'll be a screw in there. And, and uh, so a little bit more modern take on a, on a, on a slip joint style than, uh, the, the traditional style slip joint. 
Nice. Okay. All right. And so now these are, but these are all, these are all full customs. Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Cool. And, um, all right. That's, that's exciting. So where, where's the best place to keep track of your work? Uh, do you, do you have a, you prefer Instagram, Facebook, your website? Where's, where's a good place for people to, to keep track of, of what you're up to? Yeah, right now it's it's my Facebook page, Craig Cammer, uh, or my Instagram, Craig Cammer. Uh, that's all my newer stuff is on that. Like I said, I'm redesigning my web page uh, to be more user friendly for me, uh, and then I'll be able to post newer stuff on there. My web page, unfortunately, hasn't been updated in probably seven eight years, uh, but uh, my social media, I, I stay pretty active on that and keep stuff uh, going through. Uh, you know, and, and the forums, I try to do things on the different forums. Uh, I haven't been as active recently. It's just so easy to be in the shop and, and snap a pic and post it right to Instagram or, or uh, Facebook. Uh, the forums get neglected sometimes, but uh, but I'm still a big fan of the forums and get on there and look around and read around and that type of thing. Nice. Okay. So definitely keeping up to date with the with the Instagram and, and the Facebook yeah, and the, and the website the website is is on its way. Yeah, it's it's on its way. Uh, it's just so easy to build a website. I'm ashamed that I haven't built one and no. and uh, kept it up to date anymore. Uh, Social media oldest. has 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 made it so easy to to communicate with people. It has. That's, it really has. That's the thing. Yep. yep. All right. Well. Well. Awesome, man. Uh, I I don't. I did we miss anything? I, I think we've talked about most everything I've got going on. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Killer. Well, I, I'm very excited for, for the slip joint and for the auto. I think that's that's an awesome that's an awesome step forward. I like how you're just – you're soldiering ahead. You're, you're keeping one foot in the forging world and another foot in the tactical market. I think that's an excellent way to do it. It's like the yin and the yang. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And it keeps me from getting bored, uh, honestly. You know, if I just – forge knives out all the time or made tactical knives all the time i would get bored uh the continuums you know i've made a lot of them and and i tried to limit them to you know 10 or 15 at a time as i did my run just so i didn't get tired of making them uh and i've i've done you know other runs with with different companies and stuff where i do 50 to 100 and by the time you get to the end of that you you really don't even like to look at it anymore uh i like to keep it fresh and exciting and it keeps me involved well that's good that's that's awesome to hear you know when when the job gets boring and stale it's it's not fun anymore yeah when it gets boring and stale heck you just switch to a different knife see there you go <laughs> that's right, or a different style i'm loving it exactly or a warhammer cool. all right <laughs> Well, hey, hey, man! I want to, uh, I want to say thanks for for coming on tonight and and talking to us uh, about your work and about your future projects. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to to all of it, what what the future holds, and uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna look forward to Blade Show, which would be your next show. For sure, for sure. But yeah, no, I uh, I appreciate you guys having me. This has a been been my honor to be on here. I I really enjoyed it and and uh, love talking with y'all. Very cool. All right, nice. Um, and on that note, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the wrap. This is this is Jeremiah Burbank from PVK Vegas. Everybody, thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Bladeology podcast. Elijah Isham of Isham Blade Works. Have a good night, everybody.